first, I just wanted to say that I had noticed that Colorado had a great uh, credo on their license plate. Do you guys know what it is? Respect life? Yeah, I think it was preserve life. Yeah, anyway. It's respect life? Anyway, equally great. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, and actually, I noticed recently Williamsburg, where we live in New Mexico, has nurture your nature. Another good one. So, um, since I've been in Colorado, I've received a, an unusual number of gifts. I don't know what's happening in this state, but I got like three books gifted to me, two bars of soap, a Japanese lock. Anyway, people just keep giving me things. Is this normal here? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's really amazing. Anyway, it's been very nice. So um, I'm here because I wrote The Good Life Lab, Radical Experiments in Hands-On Living. And uh, I wanted to start by just explaining why this book has an unusual format. So two parts of it are memoir, and one part is tutorials. So the reason for that is because as the first generations alive to see the entire world for sale, we all share in common that we were born into a commodified world. So it was like that when we got here. And because of that, we take for granted the ways that it shaped who we are, and we don't really see them. So because my story is about decommodifying our lives, even though my story is going to be different than yours, uh, it's the va there's value in sharing the story because there are some things that are fundamentally the same. So that's the memoir. And then the tutorial section is more um, how to do things, how to make biodiesel, how to make uh, various you know, ferments in the kitchen, and it's very practical. So I wanted to start with a story that took place about 10 years ago in New York City. Um, I was at a costume party and um, I uh, rigged up this stuff called EL wire. It's like wire that if you plug it into a battery, it illuminates like neon. It's really cool and it's bendy and you can make stuff out of it. So I made a costume that was um, a broken heart because I had a broken heart at the time. And I was flashing in red and uh, in the dark from the far end of the room came this green EL wire creature flashing in green. And I was like, what's that? And he walked over to me and I could see that he was a Band-Aid and his costume, the Band-Aid like started at his hip and went across his chest and it looked like a beauty queen sash. So the Band-Aid walked over to me and said, um, are you a broken heart? Because I'm a Band-Aid. <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> and so the Band-Aid is Mikey. He's the other figure on the cover. And that would actually be the start to a lot of things that uh, really a whole change in the way that I was living my life. So the Band-Aid and I discovered that not only did both of us really like to make things, but we wanted to really make more things, like all the time kind of make things. And then um, together we started noticing some other unusual things. So it was at that time that we started to count all the decisions we made based on money. And when I looked at those decisions, they actually turned out to be like the worst decisions I ever made ever. So it was like in college, I switched from major in art to major in business because I was scared I couldn't pay my student loans. And then I took the job that had the medical insurance even though it was the lesser of jobs and so on. And they were all the intersections where things went wrong. So I noted that. We also identified together that because we didn't have time to make things, even though we thought maybe we could make these things better and more responsibly than industry was making them, um, we realized our jobs were essentially in the way. We were working really, really hard, like in a pattern loop, working to gain money to buy stuff. And we knew the stuff was not being made responsibly, like in terms of carbon footprint and pollution and sweat labor and just so many things. Um, so we're working really hard to buy money to buy stuff that we could have made better and more responsibly ourselves, but we didn't have the time. So it was this weird loop. So um, we did something unusual, considering that we spend all of us our lives in our jobs. We asked a funny question, which is, what's really the cost of these jobs? So I'll tell you a couple of things that were on my list and then see what might be on your list. So my list had... Um, I, didn't, I, I always disliked having an extra wardrobe just for work, and often that was the kind of clothes I had to send to the dry cleaner, and there was that whole extra thing. So it was an expense, and it was a, a pain in the ass. And, <laughs> and then I had things like commuting fees, and, um, and then I also had some emotional costs. Like I, I couldn't re remember an employer that hadn't at some time asked me to lie for them. So that was, for me, an emotional cost. So um, what else might be a cost to having a job? Health. 
mm-hmm. being having to be sedentary all the time and um, you know just uh, not good for the body to have to sit hours upon hours. Mm-hmm. So we're sort of not meant to sit all the time and look at screens and it's kind of artificial. Loss of creativity. Mm-hmm. If we're lucky, we have some creativity, but even that, it's tailored to someone's need. Somebody else's agenda. Yeah. We often described our conundrum as um, we were stuck making a world someone else envisioned instead of one that we envisioned. So even though I actually had a creative job, um, I was a creative director for a marketing company, like a pop culture marketing company. You know, so my clients were like Lenny Kravitz, and you know, it's kind of a fun job, right? But um, mm-hmm. I was essentially just propping up other people's creativity. Yeah. What else? Relationships. Relationships. Yeah. So, in what way do you mean, like artificial? Well, I mean, if you work eight hours a day, then come home, then you know, don't, you don't necessarily have time to. Uh, take care of your kids, your, mm-hmm. you know, you just... So your relationships, in a way, kind of suffer from your absence, yeah. Yeah, and on relationships I had on my list, um, I noticed so many of the relationships in my life were really contrived. Like, I was, wi- I was in these relationships because I had to be, but neither of us would probably really choose it, so I just felt this artificialness, yeah. Empowerment. Empowerment, yeah. So explain. Uh, well, I just, it's, it's, I have this idea of like, uh, I think of like the movie The Exorcist, this person's possessed, and I see like people in our culture are possessed by the job that they, you know, they're, they're not making, like you said, they're not making decisions based on what they would like to do or what they would prefer. It's almost like they're, they've deferred their own sovereignty to something else or someone else. Hmm. Interesting. And you started off by describing that as possession. empowerment, and then and then and then it was yeah, <laughs> possession. Interesting. Yeah, that certainly is a cost. Yeah, to the culture, the society. So um, at this point in time, uh, I remember I came across a quote by the Indian mystic Krishnamurti. Maybe some of you know it. It's uh, it is no sign of wellness to be well adjusted to a sick society. And that was just like the arrow shot through the heart. You know, it really got me. And I was like, I am really well adjusted. <laughs> so, um, so we quit. So we quit our jobs in New York. And we started um, out after quitting by making a few pledges, which turned out to be really important because they carried us all the way to today. So some of the pledges are, um, we're no longer going to make decisions based on money because that never served us. We're going to make our stuff instead of buy it, at least to the degree we can. We're going to use uh, nature and waste to make our stuff because when you make a pledge, quit your job and make a pledge not to live based on money, whatever you make your stuff out of has to be free. So we live amid the largest surplus of waste ever to exist in the history of the world. So we were like, well, there, that's free, right? And that takes me out of um, demanding new resources for my consumption. And then nature, because we lived in the city and we really wanted to have a connection to nature and suspected that was important. And um, it's also free. Uh, and then the last pledge was we pledge to live um, for abundance instead of wealth. That would be what we were seeking. So we started at that time a blog, which we still have. It's called Holy Scrap. And then we started a list of things we no longer buy. And that we still have that as well. Uh, so we left here, we left New York and we found ourselves in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. So we went down there and what we saw was, <laughs> that's a real place, what we saw, yeah, was, um, you know, a whole population of 7,000 people, middle of the desert, kind of like an island, and all the structures and buildings looked like they were just like slapped together with bits of things found next to dumpsters, but it was beautiful in a way, it was like really harmonized. And um, lots of nature, tons of raw materials. No one has a job because there are no jobs, and that worked with our pledge because we weren't going to have a job. So we were like, and it was really, really cheap, and we were like, this is perfect. (laughs) So we moved there, and then we did what um, financial analysts would say is the dumbest possible thing you can do. We took the money we had thinking, well, the money we have is actually 
not stable because you know we don't control the rise and fall of markets and no longer is it even logical where it's like there was a short you know bad rainy season in Florida it didn't even make sense anymore it had gotten so strange so we were like money is not safe we'll just take our money and we'll convert it into something solid which we deemed to be tools like things that make other things so we got cement mixers and we got soldering irons and jigsaws and hog ring guns and air compressors and just every Everything you could possibly imagine and we crammed it into a dented shipping container in our yard and we said we're ready for anything so um, I'm gonna first just walk you through some of the practical stuff things we actually made then the second part is walking you through what we learned which is a whole different domain it has nothing to do with matter whatsoever so on the practical side we started almost like the Freudian hierarchy shelter roof overhead so we found um, this one acre RV park that was apparently extremely derelict and it was just gray gravel and had a 1967 total jalopy of a mobile home on it that anyone in their right mind would haul to the landfill. <laughs> and we considered it and we, we got a quote, it was $5,000 to haul it off. But that would have been against our pledge to live out of the waste stream, to do things better, more responsibly. So we said, well, here's our chance to do it. And my insurance company helped greatly at this time. So I asked them, what's this worth? And they said, $1,000. So I said, perfect, because I can't make it worth less if I make this mistake. So we took our power tools, and we found this guy named Jesse, uh, kind of crazy New Mexican. And when we found him, he had a client on one side of the street. He was hired to take that guy's deck apart. And then he had a client on the other side of the street. He was hired to build a kitchen. And he took every piece of wood from the deck, walked it across the street. I saw him push it through a planer, and he built the kitchen on the other side out of the same wood, which was brilliant. And we were like, this is our guy. And we hired him. But, but not to not to do the work to make us his apprentices and that's the important part because we didn't have skills so that's what we really valued and needed so Jesse basically just told us what to do so three months later we remodeled this 1967 mobile home it came out beautiful bamboo floors we resheet rocked it we took the wood from the dumpster like he did and we trimmed it out and that cost $10 a square foot, which when you compare it to new building, which is never less than 200 a square foot, we did okay. So shelter, did it better, more responsibly, used waste. So, uh, so power was next. Um, we still had a little nest egg left, a little, and we threw the whole thing at uh, PV Solar because I'm in New Mexico and we have plenty of sun. But that, of course, connected us to batteries, and batteries are one of the worst toxic contributions to the landfill in America. So there was that problem. So um, we had some maker skills that we did come with. Mikey came with some um, computer hardware uh, engineering skills from his job. So he started tinkering with a widget that we now sell in our cottage industry store, which um, resuscitates dead batteries through a process called desulfation. So it emits a very, very high pitch that we can't hear, but it breaks up the crystallization in batteries. So now we take our batteries from the dumpster, and as long as they're not completely dead, we can get them back to full vitality. And um, so we got out of that problem. So we did it with um, power, using nature, the sun, and waste for the batteries. And we went to fuel, and we did something really stupid. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, Mikey woke me up and said, I bought a Mercedes diesel in Las Cruces on eBay, and we're going to get it tomorrow. And I was like, great. I just wasn't really ready, you know? So we went and got it, and it was a jalopy again. And we were like, OK, it's waste. Let's make this thing work. And we converted it to run waste vegetable oil. So we named the car Chance because we thought there's a chance this is going to work out. And then in no time it was Fat Chance because it left us in Tucson. And then it was Slim Chance when we had to resuscitate it with our other car. And then it was No Chance. And then finally I pushed it up a hill in the desert and it was Last Chance. <laughs> and we got rid of Chance. And it wasn't because um, it's stupid to convert a car to waste vegetable oil. It's stupid to convert a crappy car to waste vegetable oil. It would have been fine if we put that investment in a much better vehicle, so that was our mistake. W you know, that was like waste gone wrong, right? So we got smarter, and today we got better vehicles, newer vehicles, though not new, and we just, uh, we buy diesel vehicles and make our own biodiesel. 
and that is actually remarkably simple. So it's a little bit of methanol and lye, swish together, dump it in a five gallon tote of waste vegetable oil, leave it in the sun for three days, it goes directly in the car, it's as easy as can be, it's 50 cents a gallon, it uses waste. Fuel, so we took that off the list, did it better, more responsibly, used waste, and moved on to food. So, I don't know if you remember the moment of realization that the food in America was severely messed up. I remember mine. It was when me and Mikey still lived in New York City. And we were having lunch in a cafe on the Lower East Side and we saw the Cisco truck. You maybe know Cisco is the company that delivers conventional food. So we see the driver get out, he pushes his little cart and he goes to like a rundown deli and he drops off food and that made sense to me. I was like, I would never eat in this deli. But then he keeps going down the street and he delivers the same food to the fanciest health food restaurant in Lower Manhattan. 100 bucks a person at least. And I thought, well, there you go. It's all the same food, no matter how you dress it. <laughs> so that was my day of wow. So in the desert, um, we really wanted to be food sophisticated and we were naive moving there. We had no idea we'd have to make our own soil. So we had to find a camel and we got his poop and we got started raising worms and we made soil. And our first year we made like a dollar's worth of cilantro and we thought that was brilliant. And then the second year I grew more and then the third year I sold some to the health food store. And today I grow about half my food in a good year. Um, so that was exciting, and we especially really like um, illegal food, like um, to make alcohol, because it's a high payoff. So if you buy, for example, um, organic 180 proof alcohol for tincture, it's about 100 bucks a gallon. I mean, you can buy a water distiller on Amazon and ferment your sugar and run it through five times and get an 180 proof. It's not legal. But um, so we like the illegal stuff because it's really got a high payoff. Another illegal food category is raw milk. So you have to lie to the farmer and say it's for your pet. And then what most people seem to learn right away, which we did is when your milk is not pasteurized and then we use it to make cheese and yogurt, it's enzymatically alive. And we thought we were lactose intolerant for so long, but we actually weren't. We just needed those enzymes. So we like the illicit foods. <laughs> and we went on to ferments and many other things, but I'm just going to cruise through some of these. So medicine was a ginormous payoff. Um, I'm terrified of pharmaceuticals. I don't like all the fast talk and the commercials at the very end where you can't even make it out. I think it's ask really... Ask your doctor if this is right for you. Yeah? So what is it? Oh, ask your doctor, yeah. This is right for you. And what if he says it is after that whole long mm -hmm. addendum? What, is the, what do you think of him now? I mean, the whole thing is just nuts. So I, I thought medicine should be simple, intuitive, free. So I went in the desert with my list of things that we get all the time, belly aches, headaches, dehydration, what have you. Uh, Mikey gets athlete's foot a lot. So we went into the desert with the list, and sure enough, creosote grows everywhere, best antifungal around, prickly pear cactus. We use the tuna for a hydrating punch, and the pads we mix into our mortars when we're building and make a, a, a replacement for elastomeric paint, which is toxic and expensive. So, um, and so on. There's yucca root. There's so, so many. So we just were able to completely abolish our need for medicines and just take that under our wing and really basically walk out the door to find it. Um, domestic goods is the last category. And um, I'm going to take a sidetrack with a quote from Carl Sagan. So Carl Sagan once said, um, if you want an apple pie, first you have to invent the universe. So for me, I had to invent the universe in a certain way. When I was back in New York, before we left, I made this pledge, I'm living out of waste, and I wanted to go shopping, I wanted to get clothes. And so I couldn't do that because I made this pledge, so I started a clothing swap. And then I, or I added some things to it because it just made sense. I always wanted to learn to sew clothes. So we added like a bunch of sewing machines and people who knew how to run them to help people modify those clothes. Then we added silk screening. Then we added workshops like how to turn a bra into a pocketbook, how to turn a sock into an iPod cover, and so many other things. And it got really big, and it's called Swaparamarama. So by the end of a year, um, 20 cities wanted to adapt it. And I had that prompt, oh, it's a good idea. I can make a lot of money doing this. But I made that pledge. So I put it in the Commons, and I made it free, and I turned it into a nonprofit, and I gave it away. And because I did, today, it's in 127 cities. 
and it's in Istanbul and Jerusalem and Paris and Germany and New Zealand, yeah, and it's really because I gave it away. Um, had I not, it would have gone maybe as far as New Jersey. Anyway, the point was, I really just wanted to make my own clothes, but then I moved out to the desert and I had to build a universe, so I had to do shelter, power, fuel, food, and three months ago I started making my own clothes, and I'd be wearing a dress I made, but I got nervous to talk the other night and sweating it. <laughs> but uh, Preston can attest I was wearing my, my own dress, yeah. <laughs> but I think, you know, a point in there, if you will, is you know, it's so easy to look at each other. We do this today because there's this like hurry up and fix the world thing. It's so easy to, to look at each other and go like, that doesn't look right. You're not doing the thing right, right? Why are you wearing those shoes or what? You know, here I am like living out of garbage, like off grid, you know, making everything. And I'm wearing clothes from, you know, the mainstream, you know, clothes from the industry because I just hadn't gotten to it yet, right? So we're all kind of in a state like that. And it's really easy to judge people. Another way that came into my life is I tend to be like very water generous. I turn it on, I wash the dish, and I use too much water. And if someone came to my house, they'd be like, why is she doing that? You live in a desert. Well, they don't know that I plumb the sink to the trees. So every time I turn the water on, I'm watering the yard. You know, so it's easy to, um, to miss these things when we look at each other. So some other domestic goods. Uh, Lufa sponge grows really well everywhere. So we replaced all the sponges, bath and kitchen. Soapberry, we almost, anywhere you live, there's a saponin-containing plant. Near me, it's the soapberry. So you can just take a bunch of berries, stick it in a muslin sack, best antibacterial, right into the laundry. You can reuse those berries 10 times. I've been using soapberries to wash my clothes for six years. It's amazing, and it's free. Um, we started roasting our coffee in thrift shop popcorn makers, because they're about two bucks at yard sales and thrift shops, and you can roast a uh, green bean really beautifully in about eight minutes with a uh, Poppery 1 and 2 are their favorite models, because <laughs> they have a good cylinder in the are bottom. Are the air poppers? No. Um, it's an air popper, yeah. yeah and you, you actually, really? anything that one. has a metal cylinder in the bottom. I didn't know that you could. Yeah, so just dump your little cup of coffee in there, let it heat up. The first batch takes eight minutes. Any batch after that is like six, five, four minutes because the heat is already there. And um, if you melt the topper, just throw it away and put a cardboard box over it. <laughs> and it works just fine. I mean, I brew like I'm, I'm traveling with my coffee. It's that good. Yeah. So anyway. Wrapping up this section, one of the things that bugged us a lot in New York, and Mikey in particular, because he's a geek, um, is that his employers were always patenting his ideas. And he wanted to create solutions for the commons and add that to the collective knowledge and not hoard it and not segment it off. So when we had knowledge, we did everything we possibly could to share it. So we started throwing skill sharing parties, like anything we figured out, even if it was just how to make pasta from an egg and flour, or maybe it was how to weld, or maybe it was making biodiesel. We just keep inviting people over like, hey, come over. And people come over and learn how to do it. You, these two, <laughs> G and Judy, were just at my house for a anti-griddle party where we learned how to make um, quick popsicles using dry ice. So, you know, they're fun and they're silly, and the more that everybody learns, the more that the community has more wealth, and it, um, it actually grows the wealth of yourself and everyone around you very quickly. So um, that connects us, of course, into like a non-monetary domestic gift economy. And then finally, um, so, you know, we couldn't pay for everything in our lives with like a bunt cake or trading with friends or swapping and bartering. And we did reduce our cost of living from in New York. We needed two six figure incomes just to live in New York. So at, by 2011, when we did the math, we had reduced our cost of living to $30,000 a year. And we were absolutely positively more abundant than when we lived in New York City. And neither of us had a job. Our lives had become our jobs. So, um, but we needed a little bit of income, so we took the skills we liked best. For Mikey, it was designing electronics. For me, it was botanicals. And we made a little cottage industry and threw some things we made for ourselves online so that if other people wanted them, they can get them. So Mikey, of course, uh, wanting to contribute to the commons, offers his widgets um, so that you can build them yourself as a kit, or he'll give you the code, whatever level. Or if you just want to buy it in fully complete form, fine. Um, but the funny thing that happened is, once we had a cottage industry, it did well. And there was this prompt, scale up. 
start to manufacture our house, send it out, hire people, um, get insurance, you need a lawyer now, now as an accountant, and all of a sudden all our knowledge is getting abstracted, and suddenly we're no longer, we're, suddenly we're back in New York, but it looks like a desert in New Mexico. So um, we thought long and hard about this and said, well, what did we do this for if it's just to cycle back in? So we decided, we, we looked around and we're like, well, we're not wealthy, but we're abundant, and that's what we said we were hoping to be. So we decided to let our cottage industry just hit a ceiling. Mikey's got 600 units backward right now, and slowly we're going to chip away at them, and we're not farming it out. The only farming out we do is we, um, we take the homeschool kids in our town, and he teaches them how to work with electronics, and they're like our little elves who do assembly, and he pays them. <laughs> so the second part of the talk, really it's in thirds, the last third of the talk, it's totally different and it really has to start with the question of so what? So, so what that I did all this? I'm not the first, I hope I'm not the last. Maybe I added some things because of my time in my generation. I added some technology and we, you know, coined the phrase digital homesteading because we apply technology to solve homesteading problems. But essentially what I'm doing is not new. So my book is uh, na the namesake of my book comes, you know, from the uh, Nearing book called The Good Life. Helen Nearing wrote it around the Great Depression. Her and her husband left New York City for Vermont. They became maple syrup, syrup farmers. And then, of course, there's Thoreau's Walden and so many others. So here's the so what. Let me sidetrack again slightly. Along the way, I wrote a credo that I thought was really brilliant. And then I realized that it had a problem. So here's the credo. The credo is, when the whole world is for sale, the maker of things is the revolutionary of the age. So when the whole world's for sale, the maker of things is the revolutionary of the age. So why would that be true? It's true because makers, just like corporations, have to source their materials, and that comes in the form of maybe stuff and goods and materials and knowledge. And when they source those materials, they learn, inevitably, inevitably everything comes from nature, however abstracted it may be, no one dropped anything off from another universe. And um, when they reach those materials and make their choices, I'm going to do it this way, I'm going to um, manufacture this way, assemble this way, I'm going to build out of this and out of that, they don't have the mandate, the actual legal contract that uh, corporations have, which is they must make the decision that is most prof profitable in spite of its diminishing life. Makers are not bound to this contract. Makers are free, and they can make any decision they like, including the one that supports life. They're also more likely to notice life, because when you source materials, all things start in nature and from life. Another reason that credo is true is makers stand on the shoulders of others. People who make things know that they can't make anything by themselves. So if today you invent the best sailing ship we've ever seen, and um, no one's seen anything like it before, you have to admit you didn't figure out how to thatch wood or sew a sail or weave. You can't make water. You cannot invent a tree from scratch. And makers know this because they go through this process of discovery. And the important part is that makers are less inclined to take credit and do the patent and the copyright and more inclined to give credit because they naturally realize that they're in this context. And that's what's needed if we're going to make an economy other than one, the one we have. So if we ever are to shift to, to a gift or a commons economy, it has to be built by people who don't need to hoard and are willing to share and contribute. So Swaparama Rama, my clothing swap, is in the commons. Anybody who wants it can have it. There's nothing encumbering them. I'm a 10-year volunteer, and it's my greatest delight. <laughs> and I've lost nothing for it. So. So what? The problem with my credo is it's still about stuff, right? It's still about making stuff. So I was just in Portland, and Portland's really fun. You can go like into a sewing shop, and there's a sewing machine, and you can learn to make stuff. And you can like learn how to ferment, and you can learn how to make wine, and everyone's teaching skill sharing workshops, and it's really amazing. But it's still about stuff. There's even actually uh, kombucha margaritas available, and you have to make kombucha. And there's a, yeah, there's a vegan gluten-free 
strip club in Portland. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to go because I wanted to know if that was the menu or the strippers. <laughs> but essentially, it's a lot of fetishizing about stuff still. Artisanal culture is taking over Brooklyn. Everyone's running out to buy $100 mayonnaise. What's essentially changed? So I think, for me, this is the difference between a trend and a movement. So, it can't be about stuff, and so how do we make it not about stuff? Well, we make it contemplative. We make meaning of our actions and pay our meaning to action. So let's just take a pause and I'll ask you, what makes contemplation different from any other mode of being, like intellectualizing and thinking? What's different about contemplation? It's nothingness. It's nothingness. So in a sense, it has no direction. It just... Uh, There's no point. No point. It's just no. observing. No go goal, just observing. Uh huh. So it has a witnessing quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It takes time, it's contemplative. <laughs> well, it's what it, it shifts the essence to being, it's you know? Doing. The essence uh, of the moment isn't just being in the moment. So when you're contemplative, no matter what you're doing, uh, you're experiencing your now moment. So it's just very much about being. Yeah. And there's a lot of value to that. I'll say. So it brings you into presence. It sounds a little bit like you're saying, yeah. I like how um, you know you stumbled on a good contemplative question when you realize that you can think about it for 10 years and not be dull from it. You know, like it still has juice and you just can never, it never ends really. And I would add, um, so for me, it also includes the heart, which the brain, like the thinking, ne doesn't necessarily require the heart. So on that note, I think I have a handout somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So this is actually um, just a page from the book, and I'm going to pass it around. So because this was contemplative for me, and I really did set out um, for it to be contemplative, I was keeping my heart and presence uh, with me as I went and really considering why as I went along and um, being observant. So um, this is one of the things I noticed. So today we actually live in two worlds. We used to live in one and that would be nature. And we're all born into it and we can take that for granted. But today there's a second world and we built it and we glommed it on top of nature and now we have two. And it's important to notice the difference between them. So each um, Nature is pink, and modern civilization, for lack of a better word, is yellow. And I'm going to just read a pair. Each bubble compares the two. And then I'm going to pass, and if you guys don't mind reading, we'll do this together. So modern civilization, we are not the same as it. We are living, and it's not. Nature, living, so it includes us. We live in and make up this world. Modern civilization artificially regulated and out of, out of balance. And nature is self-regulating, naturally strives for balance. Creates waste and cause dis causes destruction to life. And nature produces no waste. It's a perfect system. Mm -hmm. All activity has to do with the movement of money. Produces without exertion, water, fire, air, earth, everything needed to make everything. Everything made is a representation of something abstracted from nature. Nature is presence always arising. It's not representation. So that's a really heavy contemplative what I find. Mm -hmm. So civilization can't make anything because it's lifeless. Anything it makes comes from nature. It has nothing, it generates itself. It produces nothing. Its only ability is to make representations of real things. Whereas nature, everything it makes is, or is presence. That's the difference essentially between representation and presence. And you know you um, have touched on presence because presence is always arising. So it's an interesting exercise to just go into the world seeking what's arising because it'll always take you to life, and it'll never take you to civilization. So, the next one. Can be understood by comp contemplation, sorry, 
Its knowledge is free and accessible to all. That is why it's called the common sense. Civilization requires acculturated knowledge that has to be taught or mimicked, but can never be intuited. The knowledge is not guaranteed to be safe or helpful to life. <laughs> Another kind of heavy one. So in civilization, we have to study it to know it because there's nothing actually natural about it. So in order to operate in civilization and in the world, you have to go to university, you have to get a license off and a permit, and there's all these systems that will educate us to live in civilization. And without those systems, we would be quite confused. Whereas in nature, we, re we are nature, so all we have to do is observe the patterns in the weather and the systems and the cycles and the activity and movement of life, and in that is the code for our own lives, and there's nothing we cannot know through that observation, and no one needs to be teaching it to you, and it's not like it's one person gets it and another doesn't. It's equal to everybody. There was something about mistrust or trust in there, and what the mm. first thing I thought of was nature as far as making remedies for ailments in the body. Because yeah. I mistrust like you mistrust and right. I trust it's nature. Like so I, that's what I pulled out of it. Yeah, so one, you can't necessarily trust that it'll... Um, yeah, uh, you need to really educate yourself and yeah. you probably will find that you don't want to trust it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, do we have more? Yes. Um, in modern civilization, driven by an economy that requires consumption and nature abundant, always new, creative. So that's an interesting one because we're back to the pattern the loop, right? So nature is giving us everything we need for free and somehow we've managed to build this civilization where we require ourselves to go to work to make money, we're back in the pattern loop, to buy nature back but now it's slightly abstracted and that abstraction requires us to go to work to abstract it. So it's all very strange because we're, we're just putting something between ourselves and what is our birthright and what is essentially free to us. Um, yeah, so next one, Gia. Eight. Free, everything, oh, everything in nature is free and then everything otherwise is for sale. Civilization is dependent on nature for all its materials and nature is the only sovereign thing. It is reliant on nothing. Yeah, it's interesting to note like how we built a civilization that essentially requires a life support system, whether that's our energy and, and energy of all variety, and we glommed it on top of a system that is actually sovereign. It never needed anything. <laughs> yeah, the whole point is uh, exploitation. You know, I mean, I like mangoes. Yeah. They don't grow here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How much do we like those mangoes? <laughs> so um, let's just go through a few more on the um, contemplative list. Um, Although, I must say, yeah. in Snow Snowmass, Colorado, there's a project called the Rocky Mountain Institute. Mm -hmm. And it's also has people here in Boulder, are in Boulder. And uh, I forgot which bookstore has that. But um, one of the founders of the Rocky Mountain Institute, Amory Lovins, has a uh, home he built in Snowmass. And he's been growing bananas for 20 years in his foyer. And he's completely off the grid. It's passive solar. Bananas in Colorado. Yes, yes. <laughs> there's a foot of snow outside his window, there's but there's snow. bananas. He's picking bananas. And so maybe mangoes someday if we set up the right greenhouse or something. So anyway. That's a pretty major feat. Does he know that's how people talk about him, the guy who built his grows bananas in Colorado? Well, he's actually, <laughs> that's one way we, he's spoken about. He also has many books like Reinventing Fire, which is also about mm -hmm. transitioning away from burning all the carbon. And uh, he's working with governments and even some businesses, corporations around the world and mm -hmm. making that shift, that transition happen. Have you guys recorded him? Not yet, but there is some good material on mm -hmm. YouTube. He's spoken at TED a couple times. Yeah. and. Yeah, Amory, Amory Lovins, Reinventing Fire. I'd recommend that for sure. Thanks. Sure thing. 
All right, so we'll go through a couple more on contemplation before we wrap up. Um, so one thing I learned, because it was contemplative, uh, is just like we have two worlds, we have two kinds of poverty. So there's the poverty we all know and has always been here, which is I don't have enough essentially to live. And then today there's a new poverty, which is I have enough to live and I don't know that I have enough. Mm -hmm. So the way I bumped into this particular kind of poverty that was the aha moment was um, Swap Rama Rama, that textile repurposing event that I started. Um, a producer up in the Midwest had contacted me and she had a group of volunteers. She said they were a great group and a lot of artists and everyone was kind of scruffy, like not so well off. And then there was this one woman who was actually clearly well off who insisted on getting paid. And we didn't want to react quickly to that. We just thought, why would anyone ask to get paid to volunteer? Because essentially the definition of volunteering is to not get paid. So we, <laughs> we realized that um, because we took it in contemplatively that she was actually pretty expert in her life at eliciting the world to tell her what she wanted it to tell her, which is um, to keep insisting that there was not abundance and there was not enough and there was not enough and there was not enough. So she had all these great ways of triggering it, like asking for what she'll never get. So we realized that she was impoverished. Even though she had more money than all the other people on the staff, she was actually the one in poverty. So we paid her. We, she was the only one we paid. We paid her more than she asked for, so we really gave the message back that she needed to hear, which is there's plenty. <laughs> anyway, she volunteered for six years, and she um, that was that. <laughs> so poverty, having enough and not knowing it, and I think a little connected to that is... Um, it's okay to give people what they need, you know? Like, it's okay to fill that hole for people, even if it's illogical, and even if you want to, it's tempting to say selfish, like, you know, and call it something else. It's impoverished. She needs help. <laughs> anyway, so um, I learned that I'm not other from nature. Um, a teacher of mine, Pierzi Anayat Khan, had a great, has a great quote, as surely as we inhabit the environment, the environment inhabits us. I learned that civilization is not natural. And because it's not natural, we have a funny habit of, we're the natural system, it's not. So we're living, it's dead, we, we talked about this. We have the habit of having natural reactions to the artificial system that we live in, and then taking that uh, reaction, which is natural, and calling it a disease and taking a pill. So when we get sick from civilization, instead of realizing we are the common sense, and this system has no life at all, so we're the canary in the coal mine, our reaction is natural. So when we have that reaction, we're not honoring that reaction and saying, I have to fix this artificial system to adjust itself to serve life, because I'm life. So instead, we have, you know, when we get depressed and isolated and confused and overwhelmed and we start having behaviors like hoarding and all these things happen, we take a pill or we go to the doctor and make ourselves the wrong. So I learned that uh, civilization is not natural. Um, I had, uh, I tend to get very obsessive about the thoughts that I'm thinking about, and I had a few years where I just thought about value, and it was mostly because I could not find it. I was living in New York when I started on this multi-year event, and um, I remember we had a sanitation strike, and uh, the streets of New York when we have sanitation strikes, it happens every now and again. Uh, th this is the sidewalk and like both sides pile taller than you in black plastic garbage bags. It's unbelievable and it's like walking in a real weird maze. So we're walking in this maze and like I just started opening up some bags like what's in these bags, right? And they were just full. I mean there was some gross horrible stuff in there but they were mostly full of like newish consumer goods that were not faulty. It was clothes, it was consumer electronics, it was widgets, it was plastic stuff. It was stuff that you can take home that minute and put to use in your house. There was nothing wrong with it. And I know how hard New Yorkers work. I was one. It's really hard. And I'm like, why are we working so hard to buy this stuff and then pushing it to the curb in like five minutes? It doesn't make sense. So what I figured was that subconsciously, because we are life, we know that all these goods came at the cost of life. And we can't stand them. And we push them out the door because we don't want to see them. It's like shame. 
And I know that this is somewhat true because at Swaparama Rama, we gather all this used clothes and all these people come and start modifying it and tearing it to bits and reshaping it and making stuff and silk screening. And I watch people at these events and I know a lot of these garments are gonna make their way to grandchildren. They are so imbued with meaning and life and stories and joy and achievements. And the difference between that and what's in the plastic bags is life again. So what I've concluded, and I'm done thinking about value now, I'm obsessed with savoring, but that may take some years. Um, what I realize about value is the only valuable thing we have is responsibility. That's what value is. It's the um, choice and the choice to preserve life. It's responsibility. And interestingly enough, you cannot buy it anywhere. <laughs> it's not for sale. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so um, essentially, in wrapping this up a bit, hmm, essentially, I think it's about who we think we are, right? So we talk about change, we talk about sustainability, and we talk about all the stuff that's wrong with the world, and everyone's doing these things that are great things, and we're fixing a lot of stuff on the surface. but. It's, you can't just jump ship unless you have a belief in something, right? Or a str almost, you know, en enough fuel for a belief. Jump ship to what? It's like, it's like jumping off a cliff in a way to really change. But I don't think we're jumping off a ship if we change our belief in ourselves as creators. If we are not limited and mechanistic consumers, you know, the less we know, the more we buy. If we're creators and we know it and we believe it, then we can make a jump. We can actually do something that's not a stupid uh, decision. It's founded on something real that's in here and that's essentially un, um, tarnishable. So for me, it's about um, being creators and realizing it. When I lived in New York, I had like three skills related to my job and I could tell you what I did in about a minute. I think I have the page marked. But since I've been in New Mexico, this is my skill set, and it would take a really long time to tell you about it, right? So I'm a plumber, and I'm an electrician, and I'm a builder, and I'm a fermenter, and I'm kind of mediocre at a lot of this, but I'm also really good at some of it. And essentially what I learned is I can do everything well enough, and I can do everything that I set out to do. So I'm going to end with <laughs> two things. One is the most important lesson that I learned. So if you forget everything else and you just take this one lesson, it'll be great. And then the other is the only um, promise that I could make in a world that is really thin on promises. Uh, so first, the lesson. So the lesson is you have to start even if you don't know how. So when I left New York, I was a consumer. My mom, my whole life, the only time she ever said you achieved something was when I left a store with a shopping bag. I was born in Long Island, I was raised to shop. And um, so when I decided not to be a consumer and when I decided to be a maker, every day for six years, I did something I didn't know how to do. And that's really hard because our jobs present this thing of perfection, you know, get this right and it's got to look this way and it's not realistic. Being a maker is messy and imperfect and fun. So we have to begin even though we don't know how and then we have to begin again and just stay in beginning for a really long time. So the, the best lesson I have is start if you don't know how and my only promise I can make is that if you do start if you don't know how, you will discover that you are much more than you thought yourself to be. <laughs> so that's my... Um, <laughs> talk. <laughs> yeah, so now um, now maybe um, you guys can talk a little. So what do you want to talk about? Any thoughts or comments? Or <laughs> I admire your ability to jump off the cliff, you know, and just go, I get it. This isn't right. And I just needed to jump. If you don't jump, you don't know until you do. That's Admirable. Yeah, thank you. I think we all have little gifts, you know. I actually am a jumper. I've been a jumper for a while, so I'm taking advantage of my natural nature and uh, jumping on behalf, yeah. But, you know, we all have something like that where I'm scared to do the thing and you've got the thing and it's good to dig those out. <laughs> and, you know, um, what would be the point of me going first, right? So that I could say, jump, you know, the net will appear. The water's fine. I'm fine, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 
And you know, when you look at, when I looked at my future in New York, I mean, I did the math and I knew like the top and low salaries for my field. And I knew when I would get my third week of vacation and I knew maybe I might get an expense account around this time. And you know, that was a really predictable um, future. And I find that a bit boring for one, but the other was just full of possibility. I mean, it was really, um, and I knew that the first chip possibility, that employment thing, was not going to go anywhere. And every time I come back, it's still there. You know, um, you can always jump back. It's not, this thing is hardly you know, winding itself down to an end. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I was thinking about um, is this how much energy we expend on things that are outside of our control. So I think about, oh, you know, these people aren't doing that, or Congress should be doing this. Uh, and, and I'm not Congress, I'm not the president, uh, and we put this energy trying to get them to do, and it's clear like there's, they're not in tune with what a lot of us want them to do, and I, I, just this idea of, of what's in, what, recognizing what's within our control and what's without our control, you know? It could be a very punishing time, you know, because I think we're all the generations of like one foot in problem, one foot in solution, and we can't not be any other way. Like that's that's our our task, you know, our the time we live in. But um, I think it's just important to uh, find ways to cope with those kinds of things because it's like, yeah, I can't control this. Like, whoa, what do I do? How do I sleep at night? I can't. There's nothing I do. I can run over and light the building on fire. It's still gonna, you know, not work in my favor. But what we can do, and this is a, a saying that I picked up from a Sufi, is um, dismiss that which insults your soul. So dismiss is a real particular choice of words, right? It's not tolerate. It's dismiss. It's like, you know, you can turn the other cheek. Um, I don't even want to say what dismiss is. I want to leave it to you contemplatively. And then what insults your soul? So it's a really nice filter. What insults me? That's my filter. Um, and know that while we're doing the best we can, we can only be so many things. Like I said, I'm a jumper, but like I'm not a lot of other things, right? Um, but if we just focus on the one thing or three things that we know about ourselves that are our contribution and trust that a lot of others have their own peculiarities and are on the team too, um, I just think it helps. I think it helps us cope. <laughs> mm -hmm. I want to give an example. Joanne Shenandoah is a Native American woman songstress singer. She had a job like you in D.C., I think it was, and outside of her window they were cutting down this gigantic mother tree, and she wept, and that was her last day at work. Mm. She just said, I can't do this. I need to become the, sing the singer that I am and share. We have to take care of our planet. And she's become a really successful hmm. travel around the world. Bravo. Enlightening people <laughs> with her song and her consciousness. So, yeah. yeah. And again, you know, in terms of coping, it's like, you know, we can't do everything, but you can put a stake in the ground with one thing and be like, no further. Right. You know, just any one thing. Yeah. One of the byproducts of Swap Ram Rama, even in Brooklyn, it would happen. It, it helps you see how incestuous your community is, how you're all really connected. Because you're just like walking down the street, and a total stranger walks by in your clothes, and you're like, wow, that's. Amazing. Did you ever look into a catalog last night? It was a Sierra Trading Post. Yeah. Yes. I said, oh, that makes a great shirt. For me and Mikey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Rumi and Hafiz. And do you happen to know which Sufi said that comment you made? But it, I know who I heard it from, but it's not orig the original author, yeah, or speaker. That's okay. Um, you mentioned being raised to shop. Um, I want to recommend a movie called Consuming Kids, and I think it's free on YouTube, and it's about that process. And there are marketers in Manhattan, I'm sure, who target children. I think I've seen it. Okay. It's insidious, what's going on there. It's like far crazier than you think. Yeah. yeah. But when I do shop, when I feel like it has a, a good spirit about it, it's at stores like the Firehouse. Or is it the old firehouse? Old firehouse. These independent bookstores. Thank you so much for organizing this <laughs> gathering. Well, I was sitting here feeling a little guilty because I'm all about stuff. And, and, and my but house suffers from book clutter. I, I can control many things. I actually hate shopping. I despise it. And mm -hmm. it's very difficult for me to, when I have to buy something, it's a last minute panic. And I'm doing my best to add value and not make money because, believe me, bookstores do not make money. But, but if we can exist and, and spread neat books that maybe people wouldn't always encounter in their libraries. I, I'm a great supporter of libraries. We have a fabulous library here, one of the best for tiny libraries. But there's, there's times you need a book. You need a book you want to buy and it's got a different message and maybe you can take something out of it and make the world a better place and we do do try to recycle books um, there if a book has absolutely been read to death it goes into recycling but short of that if it still has some kind of hanging together we always try to find a place to get that book to move on to the person who needs to read it Great. you're opening minds which opens hearts hopefully <laughs> and you know, it's also totally okay to be about stuff, right? You know, like we need stuff. I love great stuff, but it's not okay to be unconscious about our stuff, right? So whether it's like I'm digging stuff out of the trash, at least I can acknowledge most of the plastic accessories like electronic goods, I know were made by someone in China who never in their life will afford one of the thing they made. You know, I can't necessarily jump out the gate and fix that but I could acknowledge it, right? So, you know, I mean, here I am, I'm like burning PV, clean power, PV solar, and I'm using machines and tools bought, made in manufacturing plants to make things out of garbage. You know, it's all, um, it's, it's all confusing and full of contradictions, but the one thing you can hold on to, like a life raft, is you can be thoughtful about the stuff. Because that's what the future is paved out of, you know. And then we can also hold this belief about what are we, essentially, what are we. Um, you mentioned guilt. Um, I was talking to some gr a group of, I just spent some time on a, a farm in Massachusetts just to kind of get away from everything for a, a bit. And there were these young kids there that were into yoga and permaculture and all this other stuff. And But they didn't want to talk about, or they didn't want to like enter into... Uh, like learning about the war in the Congo, you know, yet they had cell phones, you know, and, and I was saying, I was trying to make the argument that I, I think we have a responsibility to know, you know, what goes into our stuff. And one of the girls had mentioned me, she's like, well, I, I just feel guilty about that. And I was just thinking, you know, it, that doesn't really do anything for anybody. So what's your thought on that, the whole, the guilt, you know, that, that comes along with being in this, in this society? I think it's unfair that we have to feel this guilt because we actually really inherited this mess. But then again, you know, we always think people behind us are in, in time were smarter or dumber than us, and I, it was really, I think it's just us. So, you know. It's about choice, you know. Just there is free will. It, yeah, <laughs> if you're aware of it, can you shift it? There's another. Um, Little tidbit again that I took. I, I get my best stuff from the Sufis. I have to admit, um, and what it is is just this contemplation. Er, behind every effect is a cause, and behind every cause is a reason. So, like, just to play with it for a moment, let's take the girl who was hypocritical in your view on the farm, who didn't want to understand the history. 
I, I wasn't saying she was hypocritical. Uh, I think she, she was coming from a good place. Yeah. Uh, she just didn't want to look at, you know, she she, she didn't want to, yeah, like, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I wouldn't yeah. use the word hypocrite. Sorry, I, I think we're all hypocrites <laughs> to some extent. But. I agree. So, um, yeah, so every cause, ha every effect has a cause and every cause has a reason. So whether when we look out at the world, that changes things from I'm angry about this to I understand how this came to be. The latter tells us about what civilization is, how it's constructed, how it arrived, and how to deconstruct it. The former just makes us hot-headed and upset, and there's, you know, there's nowhere to take that. So, you know, for her, and I, again, now I'm just kind of going where I want with it, so it's not about what you said, but, you know, if I met someone like that, I might be tempted to use the word hypocritical, um, but I can say instead, this action, her not wanting, like maybe, she, you know, let's say someone else is, is not watching the news because they can't deal with it, right? They just can't deal with it. And you can say, well, history will repeat itself. You can't block out, you know, knowledge, blah, blah. But everything has a cause. The cause might be, I can't cope. And then beneath that is a reason. Well, why can't you cope? Well, this civilization is too massive and complex. You know, at least it takes you somewhere. So, um, I get a lot of juice out of just looking at everything through that lens. What is the cause and what is the reason? Because then there's forgiveness, then there's understanding. I learn something about the world and I don't walk away carrying anxiety and anger and frustration. Beautiful. Um, I didn't make it up. <laughs> so any other thoughts? Anybody have something they want to? Um, seems like it's difficult in, for someone that's done everything that you've done to stay off the grid and stay away from it all because I even heard you mention a couple times, oh, this idea can make me a lot of money. And then you did mention that, well, how do I, I not make money at it, give it away? But it seems like people that try to jump off the cliff or whatever you want to say it end up coming back somehow mm -hmm. is that right i mean do you see that i don't know just like she said with her friend that's successful and gets to travel the world i mean you don't travel the world without money yeah no it's interesting well i mean there's a big difference on, in how you make money too well right <laughs> and if that brings you what you need i'm all for it i'm just saying it seems difficult to stay completely off mm -hmm. and away from society and the grid and, and completely living sustainable on your own when all these other people want to say well what are you doing you know that's a good idea can I buy it from you <laughs> yeah people really want to come over a lot you can imagine where that leads huh? yeah yeah you know um, and and of course so in bed in that right is it's not like I'm insisting that I don't make money, right? But I'm not gonna do it in the way that makes me compromise life to get there. Right. But then again, so now I wrote a book, right? And now I'm on a book tour. And now I'm driving everywhere. Even if I leave the house on biodiesel, then I'm buying diesel on the road. And I'm ripping through clothes, like just running into stores, thrift, whatever, just to like maintain that, you know, <laughs> on the road. Because apparently I sweat like terrible when I'm doing these talks because I get nervous. <laughs> whatever, you know, it's like there's just this constant like stream of being in integrity, falling out of integrity. You know, and again, I think in the best world, it's to map it, to know it. And to just keep trying, yeah. You can't, I don't think there's any way you can be an island to yourself, I mean. Yeah, and who'd want to be, you know? Try. Like, I'm so glad my garden doesn't grow everything, so I can go to someone else's garden and give them some of one thing and get what they're growing. You know, like, God forbid I should be independent, really. <laughs> Were you going to say something? Yeah, that was a long time ago. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you say map it? Map it, yeah. Yeah, so map what you're doing, where you're going. Is that? Could you elaborate? We were talking about, um, you know, you can go through all this stuff and, and, like, become makers of everything. And then, essentially, what could happen is it could just wind up being about the stuff again. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about how when contemplation is paired with action, 
it's really different. So then you really like learn about the world and understand how it got constructed this way. And I think that's where we have discoveries that can be helpful, like that we're actually more than we thought ourselves to be and more capable. Um, yeah, so that has the greater impact, at least for me, like what comes out of contemplation about the stuff than making the stuff. It's like having an intention. Is that what you would say? Yeah. Really knowing what your intentions are? Yeah. It's awareness of I think stuff, it's whether different. it's in a new, your new life or in the old one, like the material world or the spiritual world. It's still all content. Yeah. I would say a little different than intention because intention has direction and contemplation for me is completely directionless. It's like goes out in all directions and then I was once. I was keeping it with mapping. Mapping. Oh yeah. Mapping. So that would mean that you could take some of the tools from what I consider the matrix, not the spiritual but the material and and port those over into the new into your new lifestyle? Is that? Sure. Sure. I mean, I don't see really boundaries between them. You know, they just seem very woven together. Okay. <laughs> and you know, I just did what I did, right? I just have my experience. Like, I can't report for anyone else, right? This is just what happened to me. I really hope some other people do some stuff and then tell me what happened to them because I'm just the jumper, right? And someone else has the other thing. And again, thank God I'm not independent because we all fit together like a puzzle. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah it certainly comes back to community. Yeah. And even in that situation of moving away from commercialism, it still works to have more in the community, in the flow of bringing those things back into fruition. To support one another. Yeah. Um, I'll just share my uh, personal story real quick. Is uh, for the past 12 years, I've been. I started the single Argus Fest in Denver, so I show documentaries and host facilitate discussions on how horrible the world is, and there's lots of that stuff out there. Um, but it's kind of beat me down over the years, and I get cynical and angry, and the world sucks, and it, you know. And so I'm actually launching a new project right now, which is actually really in line with everything that you've been talking about tonight. Um, I bought the domain denvercommunity.org, and I figure with Argus Fest, I'm kind of constantly going on about what's wrong with the world. So I'm building a website kind of around the idea of a living revolution, which is that um, uh, pr promoting bike culture and permaculture and um, complementary currencies and everything people are doing, like what you're saying, in Denver to kind of build the world that we want to see, um, but it's it's but I still want to remind people this is why we're doing it. So I have this I want to do like an 80 20 80 percent positive, 20 percent problem. You know, 80 percent solution, 20 percent problem. Anyway, so it's like everything you're saying tonight is resonating with me. I went through a and I think it's natural even in just lifetimes, you know, for us to go through the more anger, you know, uh, against mode, and then the more for mode. Like, you don't really have to be against anything to be for something. But I think it's a really natural part of being human to go through being against things. Like, I think it goes with youth. You know, I had my day on the front line. I went to jail for three and a half days in New York for, you know, being at a protest during the Republican National Convention. I really liked being on the front line, and for a while that energy was right. But then I felt um, a turn uh, and that kind of pollution was not going to work for me anymore. And I just turned, I realized that I can be for things. And that's also energy in the right direction. You know, but I think we need both. And maybe, you know, that's sort of the um, embed beauty in having, in growing and aging. Because there's always like youth on the front line, and then there's a place to retire to. And, you know. So I do um, circle work in schools with children, and a lot of people want me to um, really focus it on bullying. And I hardly ever use the word bullying in my stuff because I don't want to focus it on that. Mm -hmm. I want to focus it on the positive and what we, we, what we can do and what we, how we can change and how we can educate our kids to be compassionate people. And so that's my turning it around mm -hmm. story with that, is that there, we have to do the positive stuff make the change that we want to be in the world. There's an interesting 
consideration. So in terms of like ignoring, right? I went through some times in my life where I had to turn the media off for a while. I just knew I was toxic and I just had to. And even though I like to be informed, imagine if we ignored the monetary system and just no longer um, gave it presence in the world, just didn't um, acknowledge it as real, right? That would be a way of um, ignoring, turning your back on something, shutting it off, and essentially that would change the world in five seconds. All power would be equalized. So I don't know. I mean, you know, there's a right moment to ignore things, and there's a right moment to shut down, and there's a right moment to protest, and there's a right moment to get angry, and to, yeah. For everything a season. <laughs> and you mentioned media. And I mentioned that film, Consuming Kids, about how toxic it can be and how manipulative it can be. But there's the flip side of the media. There's a lot of grassroots stuff. There's even stuff inside the commercial system that can be quite good at times. Sure. Um, and your story of Swaparama being spread around, I would love um, discussions at bookstores. You know, every town have their video people working on that and sharing it with the larger world. So I was wondering if you might have any advice or have you seen any stories of independent media, D DIY media? I know there's a lot of low power radio that's being developed. And um, are you seeing anything along those lines going on? I've bumped into things. I can't remember their names right now because it's been a while, but there were several in New York that were just incredible. And um, one person that comes to mind and he's still active is a Flux Rostrum. He drives around in a waste vegetable oil converted bus and reports on underreported media events. So like um, stuff that's not juicy enough, like union battles, messy union battles and, um, you know, labor practices and fights about stuff like that. And, you know, the struggles of the poor, like whatever is not making the mainstream. Um, oh, it's going to come to me later. There were so many of those groups in New York City that were amazing. And real quickly, you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Argus Fest on YouTube. We've got a, a. There's a lot of interesting material there for sure. Yeah. So tell us who you are, because we. Need um, well, my name is Preston and Wright, and this is Jason Bosch behind me, and um, we're part of a video collective of people who go around Denver primarily, but Boulder, and now Fort Collins, okay. taping interesting events going on, and then we upload the talks to YouTube. So if you want to share these things with friends, you're more than welcome to find our channel Argus Fest on YouTube. And uh, yeah, please, please share. But speaking of video material, I saw a video of yours on um, an alternative smoke, how people can pull away from the corporate cigarettes, which are so harmful. And um, I'd like to hear you discuss that. And real quickly, I want to make a confession of, you mentioned illegal food in the past or that you've been working on. I've done some illegal things, kind of counter to the system. Um, I grew as an alternative to kind of big pharma, Zoloft and Paxil. I grew some um, psychedelic mushrooms. And I had some of the, some really incredibly profound experiences with friends and it was just a beautiful the beauty of it I think was a radical thing you know in and of itself but the healing and there were some painful and scary parts of it but anyway that was something illegal I did that I think would cost Eli Lilly a lot of money and uh, so anyway was that new to you, the, the psychedelic experience psychedelic actually I'd done that before not a lot. It's something that that's another thing I like about it. It's not it doesn't make you a consumer for life. It actually breaks a lot of consumptive patterns for people. People have overcome their alcoholism. People don't have so many pharmaceuticals to take. Um, and again, that alternative you offered of the alternative smoke to pull away from cigarettes. I think that's hugely important. That's a product killing hundreds of thousands of people, so please, I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, there's not really very much of a sexy story around it other than I like to smoke, and I was like, I need to do something. So um, I found that Mullen was in my environment, and um, I just gathered a whole bunch of herbs, and I kept trying the um, 
uh, natural cigarettes in the stores and they all smelled like cat pee for some reason. Like they just were terrible. So I made one that I still make and I sell to others now and it's mullein, uh, marshmallow root, chamomile, hops, lobelia. Lobelia actually um, helps wow. cut nicotine withdrawals. Hops makes it, uh, gives it depth and it also has a relaxing quality. Mullen is an expectorant, so it actually cleans out your lungs. When you smoke yeah, this, you start nice. hacking up whatever's in your lungs. Mullen is harsh for me. Yeah, mine. but not with all the other stuff. Really? It really softens it, in particular the hops, yeah. So you find that it depends on how you prepare the herbs, just like if you were going to do it for a tea or anything else. I mean, if you leave yeah. it and you dry it hot and fast, it's going to burn right. hot and fast. Right? I try to keep a little moisture in those leaves and I hand um, okay. do it, yeah. And that helps a bit. And then I often tell people when they buy it to keep a, a slice of carrot in the container to keep moisture. Mm -hmm. And that keeps it from being really hot and harsh. But yeah, you know, I just, I start with myself. Like I needed this and I was like, all right, I'm probably not the only one. And actually that product sells really well at our store. <laughs> We had some, um, I want to just mention, because you made me think of it, um, we have a, a plant in New Mexico called ephedra. Oh, it's, it's actually the root of methamphetamine, to be yeah. um, frank. And, you know, it's funny, like many places in America, there are meth houses. And, you know, it's funny that the meth houses don't even know that the ephedra plant growing in their front lawn is actually what they're looking for. Right. And they just trip over it to get wherever. <laughs> It's so strange, but anyway, ephedra um, as a tincture is um, a natural stimulant, a bronchial opener. It has a lot, a lot of medicinal um, attributes, and I sell it in my online store, even though the Asian yeah. variety is illegal and mine is questionably legal. Um, we'll see what happens. But mothers write to me and tell me they've taken their kids off Ritalin by using it. Oh. Um, Handicapped people tell me they haven't been able to clean their house in 10 years and have gotten, you know, were physically able to manage doing that. So, you know, uh, I always worry when someone says, I'm, do I'm gonna um, protect you from yourself, it's which... The, um, it's the good crack. Yeah, it's the good crack. <laughs> Another thing about abstracting plants, like poppy, right? You know, pharmaceutical companies, they take this one alkaloid and they separate it out from every, the whole family that was with it, right? So now, of course, we know heroin is like the most addictive thing ever, right? But if you left it with the alkaloids and grew the poppy and then made the smoke and took it in, some of those alkaloids would make you fall asleep before you could smoke enough to get addicted. Like there's all these buffers that um, pharmacy misses. Yeah, and they make things that are natural dangerous, essentially. Have you ever been to Burning Man? Quite a, no quite a number of times, yes. <laughs> it's actually in the book. Um, that was the spark for the gift economy, living in the gift economy specifically. Like, that just was the reset button that I was like, I can no longer exist without participating in a gift economy. Yeah, I've been going since 05. Uh -huh. 2005. I started in 99. I got to see that little bit of a smaller version, yeah. but... Are you going to see no, and Burning Man really, the Burning Man headquarters loves this book, and if you read it, yeah, you'll see why. That's how you found they, out. They, um, they Megan R. sent it out. Oh, yeah. It. Yeah, they love the book because it's, it's a very uh, positive book for Burning Man because they really influenced me in tremendous ways. So they keep trying to get me to do all these on playa bookstore stops, but like, if you've been to Burning Man, you know, you don't just stop at Burning Man. You have to prepare for like five months to make that stop. So I, I'm not going to do it. So you're not coming? I'm not going. Um, instead, I'm actually um, doing some gigs where I'm uh, giving this talk at the premiere opening in different cities of Spark. Oh, yeah. It's the new Burning Man film. So me and the director are doing panel workshops at the end after the film, and we're, I'm doing that instead. That's yeah, nice. it'll be yeah. fun. Yeah, so I don't know if anyone has a connection to New York, but my most exciting stop on this tour so far is um, mid-September in New York City. Do you know the artist Alex Gray? Yeah, I've so at the Village. Uh-huh, right, at Burning Man. <laughs> so I'm doing a three-hour Sufi version of the book as a contemplative workshop at his gallery in Wappingers Falls, mm -hmm. and uh, they're going to follow that with a dinner and then a dance party. So that should be, that's going to be like my best stop ever, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I want to wrap with, uh, I, I keep forgetting to say this, so the Good Life Lab has a Facebook page, 
and it scrapes my blog. So if you want to check in and just see what's going on, that's a nice way to do it. I'm also on Twitter under my name. And then I want to just mention that my publisher's story has been so super great. If you've seen the book, it's filled with illustrations, and it has this beautiful bind, which lets the book open flat, which books don't do anymore. Which is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I'm not the only person they published, obviously. So I'll tell you what they published. They published practical information that encourages personal independence in harmony with the environment. So do check out their other books. All right, well, I guess we'll wrap here. Thanks so much for coming. It was a lot of fun chatting with you. <laughs>
And uh, I wanted to start by just explaining why this book has an unusual format. So two parts of it are memoir, and one part is tutorials. So the reason for that is because as the first generations alive to see the entire world for sale, we all share in common that we were born into a commodified world. So it was like that when we got here. And because of that, we take for granted the ways that it shaped who we are, and we don't really see them. So because my story is about decommodifying our lives, even though my story is going to be different than yours, uh, it's the va there's value in sharing the story because there are some things that are fundamentally the same. So that's the memoir. And then the tutorial section is more um, how to do things, how to make biodiesel, how to make uh, various you know, ferments in the kitchen, and it's very practical. So I wanted to start with a story that took place about 10 years ago in New York City. Um, I was at a costume party and um, I uh, rigged up this stuff called EL wire. It's like wire that if you plug it into a battery, it illuminates like neon. It's really cool and it's bendy and you can make stuff out of it. So I made a costume that was um, a broken heart because I had a broken heart at the time. And I was flashing in red and uh, in the dark from the far end of the room came this green EL wire creature flashing in green. And I was like, what's that? And he walked over to me and I could see that he was a Band-Aid and his costume, the Band-Aid like started at his hip and went across his chest and it looked like a beauty queen sash. So the Band-Aid walked over to me and said, um, are you a broken heart? Because I'm a Band-Aid. <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> and so the Band-Aid is Mikey. He's the other figure on the cover. And that would actually scrap. And then we started a list of things we no longer buy. And that we still have that as well. Uh, so we left here, we left New York and we found ourselves in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. So we went down there and what we saw was, <laughs> that's a real place, what we saw, yeah, was, um, you know, a whole population of 7,000 people, middle of the desert, kind of like an island, and all the structures and buildings looked like they were just like slapped together with bits of things found next to dumpsters, but it was beautiful in a way, it was like really harmonized. And um, lots of nature, tons of raw materials. No one has a job because there are no jobs. And that worked with our pledge because we weren't going to have a job. So we were like, and it was really, really cheap. And we were like, this is perfect. <laughs> so we moved there. And then we did what um, financial analysts would say is the dumbest possible thing you can do. We took the money we had thinking, well, the money we have is actually not stable because you know we don't control the rise and fall of markets and no longer is it even logical where it's like there was a short you know bad rainy season in florida it didn't even make sense anymore it had gotten so strange so we were like money is not safe we'll just take our money and we'll convert it into something solid which we deemed to be tools like things that make other things so we got cement mixers and we got soldering irons and jigsaws and hog ring guns and air compressors and just everything you could possibly imagine and we crammed it into a dented shipping container in our yard and we said we're ready for anything so um I'm going to first just walk you through some of the practical stuff, things we actually made. Then the second part is walking you through what we learned, which is a whole different domain. It has nothing to do with matter whatsoever. So on the practical side, we started almost like the Freudian hierarchy, shelter, roof overhead. So we found um, this one acre RV park that was apparently extremely derelict and it was just gray gravel and had a 1967 total jalopy of a mobile home on it that anyone in their right mind would haul to the landfill. <laughs> and we considered it and we, we got a quote, it was $5,000 to haul it off. But that would have been against our pledge to live out of the waste stream, to do things better, more responsibly. So we said, well, here's our chance to do it. And my insurance company helped greatly at this time. So I asked them, what's this worth? And they said, $1,000. So I said, perfect, because I can't make it worth less if I make this mistake. So we took our power tools, and we found this guy named Jesse, uh, kind of crazy New Mexican. And when we found him, he had a client on one side of the street. He was hired to take that guy's deck apart. And then he had a client on the other side of the street. He was hired to build a kitchen. And he took every piece of wood from the deck, walked it across the street. I saw him push it through a planer, and he built the kitchen on the other side out of the same wood, which was brilliant. And we were like, this is our guy. And we hired him. But, but not to <laughs> not any Kravitz and you know it's kind of a fun job right but um, I was essentially just propping up other people's creativity yeah 
what else? Relationships. Relationships, yeah. So in what way do you mean, like artificial? Well, I mean, if you work eight hours a day, then come home, then, you know, don't, you don't necessarily have time to uh, take care of your kids, your, mm -hmm. you know, you just... So your relationships, in a way, kind of suffer from your absence, yeah. Yeah, and on relationships I had on my list, um, I noticed so many of the relationships in my life were really contrived. Like I was, I was in these relationships because I had to be, but neither of us would probably really choose it. So I just felt this artificialness, yeah. Empowerment. Empowerment, yeah. So explain. Uh, well, I just, it's, it's, I have this idea of like, uh, I think of like the movie The Exorcist, this person's possessed. And I see like people in our culture are possessed by the job that they, you know, they're, they're not making, like you said, they're not making decisions based on what they would like to do or what they would prefer. It's almost like they're, they've deferred their own sovereignty to something else or someone else. Hmm. Interesting. And you started off by describing that as possession. empowerment and then, and then, in, and then it was, yeah, <laughs> possession. Interesting. Yeah, that certainly is a cost. Yeah, to the culture, to the society. So, um, at this point in time, uh, I remember I came across a quote by the Indian mystic Krishnamurti. Maybe some of you know it. It's, uh, it is no sign of wellness to be well adjusted to a sick society. And that was just like the arrow shot through the heart. You know, it really got me. And I was like, I am really well adjusted. <laughs> So, um, so we quit. So we quit our jobs in New York and we started um, out after quitting by making a few pledges which turned out to be really important because they carried us all the way to today. So some of the pledges are um, we're no longer going to make decisions based on money because that never served us. We're going to make our stuff instead of buy it, at least to the degree we can. We're going to use uh, nature and waste to make our stuff because when you make a pledge, quit your job and make a pledge not to live based on money, whatever you make your stuff out of has to be free. So we live amid the largest surplus of waste ever to exist in the history of the world. So we were like, well, there, that's free, right? And that takes me out of um, demanding new resources for my consumption. And then nature, because we lived in the city and we really wanted to have a connection to nature and suspected that was important and um, it's also free. Uh, and then the last pledge was we pledged to live um, for abundance instead of wealth. That would be what we were seeking. So we started at that time a blog, which we still have. It's called Holy. Not to do the work, to make us his apprentices. And that's the important part, because we didn't have skills. So that's what we really valued and needed. So Jesse basically just told us what to do. So three months later, we remodeled this 1967 mobile home. It came out beautiful, bamboo floors. We resheet rocked it. We took the wood from the dumpster like he did, and we trimmed it out. And that cost $10 a square foot, which when you compare it to new building, which is never less than 200 a square foot, we did OK. So shelter, did it better, more responsibly, used waste. So, uh, so power was next. Um, we still had a little nest egg left, a little, and we threw the whole thing at uh, PV Solar because I'm in New Mexico and we have plenty of sun. But that, of course, connected us to batteries, and batteries are one of the worst toxic contributions to the landfill in America. So there was that problem. So um, we had some maker skills that we did come with. Mikey came with some um, computer hardware uh, engineering skills from his job. So he started tinkering with a widget that we now sell in our cottage industry store, which um, resuscitates dead batteries through a process called desulfation. So it emits a very, very high pitch that we can't hear, but it breaks up the crystallization in batteries. So now we take our batteries from the dumpster, and as long as they're not completely dead, we can get them back to full vitality. And um, so we got out of that problem. So we did it with. Um, power using nature, the sun, and waste for the batteries. We went to fuel and we did something really stupid. So at three o'clock in the morning, Mikey woke me up and said, I bought a Mercedes diesel in Las Cruces on eBay and we're going to get it tomorrow. And I was like, great. I just wasn't really ready, you know? So we went and got it and it was a jalopy again. And we were like, okay, it's waste. Let's make this work. And we converted it to run waste vegetable oil. 
So we named the car Chance because we thought there's a chance this is going to work out. And then in no time it was Fat Chance because it left us in Tucson. And then it was Slim Chance when we had to resuscitate it with our other car. And then it was No Chance. And then finally I pushed it up a hill in the desert and it was Last Chance. <laughs> and we got rid of Chance. And it wasn't because um, it's stupid to convert a car to waste vegetable oil. It's stupid to convert a crappy car to waste vegetable oil. It would have been fine if we put that investment in a much better vehicle, so that was our mistake. We, you know, that was like waste gone wrong, right? So we got smarter, and today we got better vehicles, newer vehicles, though not new, and we just, uh, we buy diesel vehicles and make our own biodiesel. And that is actually remarkably simple. So it's a little bit of methanol and lye, swish together, dump it in a five gallon tote of waste vegetable oil, leave it in the sun for three days, it goes directly in the car. It's as easy as can be, it's 50 cents a gallon. It uses waste fuel.